So today we're going to talk about uh, databases on containers. And really this is a 30 minute session, so we're not going to be able to dive too deep. But after this, you will be able to start from the beginning, install Docker at, to the end and have a container running and have a Postgres database running on that container. Okay. So we already did kind of go through my experience and what I work with. Um, I do have experience with both Postgres and MySQL in the community versions. So we'll go ahead and move on since we've talked through that. Um, for today's agenda, we're going to talk about a little bit about what is a container. So we kind of all start off on the same level set. We're going to create the container and in this I'm going to uh, show you how to do this in Docker. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the network and the network that is already provided as well as what you can do. We're going to connect to the database, obviously very important. We're going to talk a little bit about backups and then some cloud options that you do have and that you can use. Then we'll talk about replicas and then I added this in uh, just to talk a little bit about some of the arguments against or so why you may not put your database on a container. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started here. So the first thing that we need to know, right, what is a container? And I do have a picture after this slide, so uh, may make more sense when we look at the picture. Um, a container is really that lightweight standalone instance that you have everything with you. So you've got your code, you have your runtime, you have tools, libraries, all of that. Uh, but different than say a VM is you don't have your own individual OS that you have to monitor and patch and, and just kind of keep track of, right? The Docker, uh, the container sits on top of that, right? A lot of people use containers, it's synonymous now with microservices. So instead of having that old monolithic database that you used to use or like in commercial, you can uh, kind of split and break apart where it makes sense, right? The things that need NoSQL, then you can put that into a NoSQL database instead of trying to put everything into one engine or into one particular instance, right? The one thing that is probably the most important when you're talking about containers and databases is that you need to have a step to have persistent storage. By default, uh, containers don't. They have ephemeral storage, which of course means that if I bounce or I have a reboot, then my data goes away. Okay? There are ways to make this work without doing persistent storage. Uh, it's just a lot of work on your point and it depends on what you need as far as to store your data on whether you even want to try that. My recommendation is just to use that persisted storage. Okay. Um, you do want to make sure and factor in backup and restore. That makes sense, right? We're talking about databases here. So I can do that through, hey, I can have a replica and maybe that's how I'm doing a backup. But I would also uh, make sure that you have a plan to do that restore, whether it's even in that ephemeral situation that I'm just recreating my container and then populating it with data from a backup. Okay, and the other thing that you might want to look at is decide whether you want to do this on premise or in the cloud. Right, I might want to start and play all around on my own laptop or I may have situations where I ha can put that in uh, on premise. Sorry about that. I'm noticing my curtain is is fluctuating there. Um, or do you put this in the cloud, right, that you can have some of that replication that's already there for you. Okay, so here's that picture that I promised, right? On the left here, this is just a VM, something we're probably very familiar with, where I have my infrastructure and then I have my host that's for my infrastructure, that operating system. Then I have my hypervisor and then I have my different VMs, right? Here I've got app one, two, and three that sit on top of the hypervisor. And each one of those VMs has its own OS. So this could be Ubuntu, this could be Windows, and this could be a Red Hat, right? So I can have different operating system, but each VM is, has its own, right? So I have to be responsible for patching that as well. When you get to containers, I have my infrastructure and host operating system, like I did before over there. But then I have Docker and I don't have the individual OS, okay? So there's less that's, um, that is in the way I guess. It's uh, easier to start, it's faster to start, and so I can have a lot of those individual applications, that microservice that can help my business perform at a faster rate. Okay, 
So what is the first step that we have? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to create the container, right? So what you do then in this particular case, I've got a link where you can go and just download the Docker software. Um, my system is Windows. It let me, there's a Windows installer and there's a Unix installer. So very straightforward. There are some steps in between this. It's not just three steps, unfortunately, but I, it, so the steps are you download your software, you install your software, right? Um, when you get to the point of creating the database or getting to where we've got, like in my situation, I'm gonna present on Postgres, I can actually use a image that's already out there. And you can see here, there is a way to look at this in a GUI format. You can also do this through just a command line as well. But I can go in and I can create this Postgres image, okay? It'll give me a line commands that I can use. So it makes things a little bit easier, especially if there's already an image there. If you're wondering, yes, you can create images too. So you can see I've got a CentOS image for Postgres 7, but there are different times I can go in and create my own images so that I can use that, say I wanna always keep dev going, right? So I can recreate my image after I've created dev and then made it an image, okay? So once I get to that point, you can see here, I can create the database with persistent storage. So two ways you can do this. You can actually create the storage outside of this. So I can have volumes that I've created that are persistent. But I think it's easier for me to create it as part of when I create the database, okay? So the big thing is, is just the V for volume and it will create a volume out there for persistent storage. Uh, Docker does have different, uh, you know, you can create storage, you can delete storage, uh, however you wanna work that, right? So you can see here, the other thing I've done is I've named it a port. I've just given it the default Postgres port, okay? And then I could create my database. When I do that, the next step is I can run Dr. PS, Docker, not Doctor, okay? And it will show me that it's running. It will give me the name of my instance, give me a little bit more information like the container ID, which is important when you're uh, monitoring your containers and keeping track of your containers. We won't go into that too much today just because we have a short amount of time. Okay, the next step that we had on there is networks. So it's important to note that when you first create your Docker container, you're going to get three default networks, all right? So you can have the bridge network. That's actually the network that containers are run in by default, right? Um, you can set it up to automatically install rules that it beha behaves. You can set it up so that it can't communicate, right? There's things that you can do with that. You also automatically get a host network. So that is the host networking directly, right? And then you get a none. <laughs> really what the none is there for is it's gonna disable all the networking, right? So if I don't wanna delete things, I can disable it. Probably the more important to note is that you can create your own. So I can create my own network that I use and say, okay, when I've got these containers, they can only communicate with other containers that are using a particular network or that network, right? So it's, as far as commonality, it's kind of whatever you choose to do. I've definitely seen a lot of the create your own versus using just the bridge that comes with it. But when you're playing around, it's not necessary unless you just wanna to learn to create your own network. Okay. So I've created my database, right? I've created my um, network, right? First, I've created my container, then my database, and my network is up and running. So the next thing I need to do is connect to it. When you create that container, it will actually tell you the IP, but if you don't write it down there, this is how you can find out to get your IP, right? It's very common for me, I forget to write things down. So I can go in and say that doctor inspect, and it will tell me what my IP is for my container name. There's that ID I was talking about. So when we go back and we look at that PS, it will tell me my Docker, uh, my container ID, right? Then I can come and put that in here. One of the ways that I use that, okay? So now I find my IP address. I can write that down. Another way I can do this without getting the IP address is I can right here on when I'm looking at my, uh, whether it's through the GUI or I've got um, host access, I can do this docker exec it, the name of my instance, and then in this case, I'm gonna use a bash, right? So what that will do is that will give you a host access, a root access, okay? Once I have root access, I just su to Postgres, and then I can go into PSQL, 
almost said the PL SQL, like for Oracle. You can go into PSQL. Right? At that point, I'm in PSQL. I'm in my database. I can run whatever commands that I want to. So I can get connection info. I can get the list of my databases. Right? I can create a database. I can create users. Right? I can maybe change a user, user password, or anything like that. I can do anything I can do in Postgres at this point. All right. So if I change that user or create a new user, let's call, say it's called monitor, right? Then I can set up a connection to PG Admin because I have my IP address, right? I have my name, I have my user, and I have my password as well as my port. I know that I set it to the default port. So I can connect to PG Admin and then do everything that I could normally do in a Postgres database in this particular instance. Okay, great. So let's talk through backups next. So again, um, as a DBA mindset and former DBA, backups are very important, but restore is even more so. And that's why I take a backup. So that in case there's an issue, I can restore. All right. So if you take what would be a Docker backup, all you're doing is a physical. You're going to zip up the data files that you have and move that or copy that somewhere else. Okay. The other thing I can do is I can take a logical backup. Okay. So I can go down to my host. Remember, again, I got out to the root and I asked you to um, Postgres. Then I can do a PG dump, right? Or I can do a PG dump all, right? That, if what I can do is I can schedule those to run. So I can say that I want the PG dump. In this particular case, I've got just for one table that PG bench accounts, right? And I want to put it in a particular file. Or I can put the PG dump all and run it every 24 hours, ever, whatever time that I want to run that. There are other ways that you can do backup, but I feel like this, especially coming from a community side, these are probably the easiest ways, right? So, and things that you're familiar with, that you can do that backup, okay? Restore is gonna be the same thing. I don't have a slide on restore, but restore is gonna be the same that I would in Postgres in this particular scenario. So if I was putting another database on there, it'd be where, however I restore the data. It's another reason I like that PG dump because if I keep that in a secure location, then I can just replay that uh, file as SQL statements if I want to restore or clone, okay? Okay, so now let's take a moment and let's talk about a couple of the cloud options that we have. So we have ECS, EKS, and Fargate. Switch those up a little bit that well you'll see. But I am gonna start with ECS, which is actually stands for Elastic Container Service. Okay, so you can see kind of a picture over this. This actually includes Fargate as well, which is the next slide. But you can see I've got my container image. One of the things that's, that's really great about this is it makes it, if you're not that familiar with Docker or not that comfortable with uh, that particular service, you can build a very fat, very fast, let me step back a second, very quickly, you can build in uh, containers uh, within ECS. Okay, so I don't need to have all of that download or anything. I just go into ECS and then I create my first container. Okay, after that container's up and running, I can do different things like assign different task definitions to that. I can say which images that I want to run. And those images can actually come from not only within EKS, right, within AWS. I can also have those images stored someplace else. Okay. So if I've got uh, images that are stored, I can pull an image from there. I don't have to move everything. It can be in one location, okay? So you can see some of this screen here if I go in and, and look a little closer. Here's my task definition. I've got just uh, my VPC, right? You can see here that this is in within one region. In AWS, regions is a collection of physical data centers. And in availability zone, that AZ1, is a logical collection of data centers, or really what it is, is each availability zone is its own data center, okay? And so those different availability zones are on different floodplains, different insurance things that you would think about within single millisecond latency. So it's a good first place if I want to have um, disaster recovery, right? Because it, since we put those on different floodplains wherever possible, if something were to come along and knock out a data center, you'd still have another availability zone. Okay, and then within that, I have the different tasks. You can see I've got different um, ENIs, and then outside of those tasks, I have Fargate. Okay, well, what is Fargate? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. What Fargate does is it is for containers, and it's that 
kind of serverless idea, okay? So it's on demand, it right sizes the capacity. So you don't have to provision, you don't have to size, you don't have to add space to it. It's going to configure and scale the, the group of those containers automatically as needed. Okay, So you don't need to choose a particular server type and then have to go back and change that server type. Right? You don't have to decide when to scale, that it's going to scale those node groups. Each pod that's running Fargate together has its own isolation boundary, so it's more secure around that as far as if I just set it up default. It also, it doesn't share an underlying kernel, okay? So it's kind of that serverless idea that I don't have to map out everything beforehand. I can just create it in Fargate and it'll grow with me. Okay, the last one that I wanna talk here on a cloud service is we have something called Elastic Kubernetes Service, all right? Kubernetes, if you're not aware, is an open source system and it is, a helps with scaling and manage of the containerized applications. Okay, so a lot of people use Kubernetes to manage those containers. Okay. So you can see here what you would do is you provision that cluster, then you can deploy different worker nodes to do things, right? I can connect my tooling to EKS, and then I can run my applications. Okay. So it just makes that easier to run Kubernetes. You also can run Kubernetes outside the cloud. So you can have that on premise as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about disaster recovery. All right, so there's a couple different ways that we can use recovery or that we can set up recovery. Okay. First thing is, is so when I first create that first container, right, I created my Postgres instance and I could create that container, I wanna create an image off of that so that I have that in a YAML format, right, a particular file format that I can run in Docker. Okay, so I can create that image. And then when I need to have an example of, let's say it's called my um, accounting Postgres, okay, my accounting instance. So if I need to have a copy of that accounting instance, anytime that I want, I can run that file and it will set it up the same way that I have set it up, right? So it's gonna look just like that. One of the great things about Docker is you can create that, okay? Then I can take the backup that I took, right? So I did my PG dump or my PG dump all, and I can restore the data into that new container, right? That alone is how I can do, that's kind of my disaster uh, situation. So if I want it in a different location or I wanna make a clone, that's a good way to do that, is to have that image and then restore the data into a new container, right? But let's talk about what about rep replicas and creating replication. So much of the time now in production, whether you're on premise or you're in the cloud, you use replicas in a production environment, okay? So you can create replicas when you're in a container. So I put in here, this is an example code from a particular website there that shows you step-by-step -step how to set up a replication when you're using Postgres, right? So what you're going to use is just that native Postgres replication, but there are third-party tools as well that you can create that replica, even if that replica isn't open, right? So maybe I just have this replica over here and I don't want anybody to hit it until I fail over, until I actually promote that to be my production instance. Okay. One of the things I would talk about, and I talk about this with everything, is to test, right? Test, 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 test. Definitely in replication as well as failover, you want to, number one, make sure it works. But the second option that you want is you want timings around that, right? I wanna know how long it's going to take for me to fail over to a replica if I have that. Same with just creating uh, the image again. Okay? So using that backup that I took because everything went away and restoring that backup. I wanna know how long that's going to take. So I know I can tell my customers what my SLO, SLA would be, my RTO and my RPO, right? So I wanna make sure that I have those time, that timing down so that I can publish it. The other thing to note here, we just talked about the cloud, the different options and the different services that are available in the AWS cloud. EKS, that's the Elastic Container Service, you can have replication there. So you kind of saw in that previous screen where I had uh, the situation where I had one particular Fargate instance and then I had another one, right? I can create that replication 
I can do, uh, this is still going to be more of that native Postgres. So it isn't going to take advantage. There is no like RDS in the containers. This is community Postgres we're talking about. So you would wanna use the same replication that we're talking about here. But as far as all of the containers, that's, that's gonna be replicated. So you definitely can set that up within EKS, okay? Another thing you can do to help with that is to create like a service scheduler or use that service scheduler. So there's a couple of different types here. We've got a replica or a daemon, so, right? So that you can, uh, you, to utilize that service scheduler. I'm not gonna go too much more into this, into that particular part of things. If you're really interested, I did put the link here that goes directly to that service scheduler if you wanna find more information on how that works in ECAs. Okay, so let's talk about, we spent all this time here talking about why I should put and how I can put databases in a container. Right? If you notice or you've looked around, there's a very widely opinion, right? So there's either a never do it, it's the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard, or I do it all the time and it works just fine, right? So it's either one or the other, there's not a lot of people in the middle. So we'll talk about some of the reasons you wouldn't. Number one, I feel like this is more for a small database or a microservice, right? So when I have that application, and I wouldn't put the application on the same container necessarily, um, but if I want to have those close together and I want to break up the microservices, that makes a lot of sense. If I have that database that's going for um, an ISV, so we talk about that down here, right? I can create individual Docker images and individual databases for each customer that I work with, right? These can be very, very small microservice size, but I need to have them separated or my company has decided that they need to each be in separate instances, okay? So then I can put the security around that so that uh, I've got only particular customers that are going there, right? So that, that can be a reason for that. I certainly don't see anybody that says, hey, I have even a 200 gigabyte database, much less a 20 terabyte and I want to put it on a container, right? It's not really what containers are for. When you think about overhead, I've got that lightweight container, right? I've got it to be virtualized. I can move it if I need to. It's more difficult to move the database because of the persistent storage. Uh, you have to do backup and recover for that for the database side, but that doesn't really equate to a large database. So in that particular case, yeah, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be on containers with that. Um, but you can, if you've got a lot of these individual microservices, individual containers, it makes a lot of sense to use containers if, again, I can make it work in my environment. I have one particular customer that had um, in AWS, they would just get the largest size EC2 instance, and then they would put Docker on it. And so they would create their own containers and their own microservices to each individual customer that they had or each individual area, okay? So depending on what your company is doing, depending on your environment, it's a great way to go. It's also a really good place to put dev instances to wrap them up really quickly, right? So if I want a real quick dev instance, I just take that image and then it's empty and my developer could do what they want to with it right, and then I can blow it away. In that particular case, maybe I don't even need persisted storage, okay? So I would say one of the other things that comes up is that a lot of cloud discussion, sometimes people look at the cloud and uh, manage databases as a way to work with microservices. Uh, I think that in that particular case, if you're making kind of the, the positives and negatives for it, it's good to have a managed database to handle that microservice database because then you can have all of the enterprise level functionality and security and recoverability that's already built in, right? So if we start talking about a little bit bigger or maybe it is a database that needs PII compliance, so I'm a little bit more concerned about having the different security wrapped around that, then maybe that's a scenario to go to a managed database in the cloud like RDS for AWS. But there are still scenarios that it do make sense and I see people in production working every day having their database on the container. Okay, so it kind of depends on what you want to learn and what works best for your environment and your company. Whether I need that 
security that's wrapped around it. I need that two-factor authentication. I need to make sure that it's there all the time and that all of my instances look the same. Like for a managed database, I need to have just the microservice that every time a new customer comes on, that I just create a new container, a new application, a new container database with that, and that I store all of their information in there. I don't, I have other security measures, maybe in my corporation, so I'm not as concerned about trying to make all of the security that I would in a managed database. Okay, all right, so what did we discover today? The first thing we talked about is what is that container, right? That, that easily scalable, easy, very quick to come up, very quick to actually delete at the same time. We talked about how you create a container. Again, we used Docker that we downloaded that Docker's, Docker software and then created the instance. Okay. We talked a little bit about networking, the three basic networks that come when you create a container, as well as that you could create your own network. Okay. We talked about connecting to the database and ultimately how I connect my tools, right? My PG admin, because I have my IP and I have my database name, I have my user password and port. Right. So whether it's PG admin, I could do the same thing for PSQL. I talked about how to create database backups. Some of the basic ways, just using the Postgres tools. Yeah, there are other ways that you can use that and look into that, but certainly PG dump and PG dump all will work for the database. Then we talked a little bit about the cloud options. What is AWS EKS, which is the uh, Kubernetes service? What is AWS ECS and Fargate? right, which is the container service, and then kind of that serverless idea around containers, right? We talked about how you create replicas in Docker. And then we also went into kind of what those arguments on why we wouldn't necessarily put something in Docker, okay? So I do have the ability to open up for questions if that is something we can do uh, to see if anybody has any questions on the material. It looks like actually um, you answered the only question that came through on the chat so far, Kathy, uh, which was um, your point about whether, whether or not to put databases on containers um, was a yay or nay. Um, so there was some discussion around that. Um, yeah, and I would say just to add a little bit more into that is that it's, it's, it's not as simple as a black or white answer. If you're in an enterprise and you, have, you don't have any microservices, then it may not make as much sense right now to put them on containers. Maybe for development, it's an easy way to spin up development instances without having to have an entire rigid cloning process for that. But it's more for, you know, it's a really good fit when we're talking about microservices and splitting up that workload. Great. I think those were the only questions um, besides um, just positive feedback for you um, okay. on the, the channel. But Great. yeah, please um, maybe check it out afterwards in case um, I missed any questions that came through. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions, we do have that Slack channel. You can definitely ask questions after the presentation, and I'll be monitoring that for a little while to see if there's any questions that come up. <laughs> 